split into roughly three parts. We're not quite finished yet because uh, I have to start earlier now, but uh, that will go on well, I think. Um, I'm going to start out uh, with some numbers about the last year, how Seaside did in the last year. So uh, a very important point is that we changed bark trackers. Before we were on Mantis, on the Mantis bark tracker, but that was sort of annoying because not everybody could submit bugs, they had to register, they had to fill a lot of forms, and we didn't get enough bugs actually. So that's why we moved to Google. Um, the Google bug tracker, which is much easier, it's just when you discover something where you are unsure or where you uh, think there is a bug, you can just submit it there, add tags if you want, but it's really simple. Basically, just a subject line is enough for us to know uh, if you have a problem with these sets. Um, this is uh, the average over the last years of visitors, how many minutes they spent on our site. And I think this is a pretty high number and shows quite a big interest in, in the site in general. Then we are currently supporting more than six small talk platforms. And this is actually what I'm going to talk about most uh, during today's presentation. So I will uh, concentrate on how we achieve this portability among uh, six uh, mostly very different platforms. We also have a new mailing list, Seaside Death List. This list has currently 80 members and it's targeted at the development of Seaside. So not at users of Seaside, that's program with Seaside but at core developers and, and people that actually contribute code. I don't know exactly why uh, there are 80 subscribers, but uh, we don't have that many contributors. So maybe there is just an uh, interest or people subscribe to the wrong way. Then we have uh, 111 Facebook group members. Join our group if you are not in there. Uh, there are also some news sometimes there uh, where you can for example, what's going on in the Seaside community when we are doing meetings or gatherings so on. Then, again, about the Seaside website. We have, on average, during the last year, we had more than 250 unique visitors per day. And I think, again, that's quite a good number. Then there are more than 800 members subscribed on the Seaside list. This is probably where most of you should go if you want to ask questions about Seaside, if you have problems about Seaside. By the way, if you don't want to touch Google and want to submit your bugs, then you can also send a mail to the Seaside mailing list and someone of us will take care to move that bug into our bug tracker. So that's also not really a problem. And then the last number I'm going to show you is actually the, the biggest success of this year of Seaside. Uh, this is the one-click image. So those of you that haven't seen it yet, go on the Seaside website. There is a link, Squeak Download. This is a, down, a download for a development enver environment that you can download with one click, start on your computer, and you have a working development environment and web server running on your machine. So that got quite a lot, lot of attention that I, I'm showing you here. Um, the visitors per day again, the number. So before I said on average it's about 200. You can see that sort of. And down here you see when we, we did releases. I forgot to update that we did a 2A3 release just just here at the end uh, of, the, of the graph. So that's August last year, ESOC, and this is August this year, uh, around the time of ESOC. Yes? So there's two questions. What's the URL? I tried common form that. Uh, it's seaside.st. Other questions? If you have questions, just interrupt. So now, the interesting thing with this graphic, of course, is what are these peaks here? So we sort of tried to identify what happened at that time and why we suddenly had almost 2,000 visitors at one day. Well, the first peak is the one-click image when we announced it. That got quite a lot of attention from several blogs and also outside 
uh, speed community or seaside community. Because people could suddenly, without having any knowledge on small talk, just download an image and have a ready seaside web server running on their machine and maybe play a bit with it. Then another peak, this is this one here. Anybody has a guess what this could be? What? No, not yet. <laughs> No, so this was our first April Schools joke. It <laughs> was also getting quite some attention from other communities and was blocked on some post uh, blocks outside the small talk community. So if you have ideas for the next year, uh, we are looking already for, for good ideas to, to get some kicks next year as well. Sorry? Yeah, you, you also find the details on the Seaside website. It's on the, um, where is it exactly, please? You can search for it. Yeah, just search for April on the, on, the, on the Seaside website. So it was, we said that we wanted to port Seaside to Java, essentially. But you can, <laughs> you find the details on the website. Good. So I've already talked about the platforms, and now I'm quickly going through uh, on what platforms on what platforms we currently run. So Squeak, this is or was our development platform of choice up to now. Uh, Seaside is very well running on the on the new Squeak for Faro as well. Uh, I'm using that personally for development. Then, also since last ESOC, it's running on GNU Smalltalk. There's a supported version of GNU Smalltalk if you like files and if you like to work on the, on the command line. That's the platform to go. And then, of course, uh, the big vendors are all still in. We have seen presentation from Syncom and Gemstone. And there is also an up-to-date port for Dolphin Smalltalk, where also the latest version of Seaside is running on. <laughs> That's still in the soon status, so I'm hoping that will be running soon. Five o'clock tomorrow morning, that's how we're going. Okay, I'm sorry. I will fix that before I distribute the PDF. So, but this platform, that's not just you don't just get all these platforms for free. So uh, before I talk about what we do as the core development team about getting this compatibility, I would like to thank all the porters that really do the hard job and make that the source code gets from Squeak into their uh, platform. So I would like to thank, for example, Dale and who else is here that does uh, a lot of porting of well, moving code around? Yeah. You too. Uh, Paolo Bontini is not here. You gotta just make it real easy. So. Yeah, that's that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that's really the hard job. So what do we do exactly about the portability? How do we ensure that our code runs exactly the same on Squeak, Faro, VisualWorks? Gemstone, Dolphin, etc. So I have split that into several sections. So I'm first going to talk about the syntax. <coughs> so for example, Squeak has this strange underscore syntax. That's a big no, we don't use it. And if you don't use it, then uh, your assignments are portable. Otherwise you are lost. <laughs> Then there are other constructs that are specific to Squeak, like brace arrays. This is also something you can easily work around uh, by just not using them and writing your array constructors by hand. Uh, Gemstone has something like array constructors in addition to syntax and Squeak. Obviously, we are also not using them. <laughs> then we have type arrays. That's in Squeak, I think, and in VisualWorks, possible. So the new compiler has it as well in Squeak, so it's sort of half in Squeak as well. 
But that means we don't use it, right? So we instantiate the byte arrays by hand. Then something from VisualWorks uh, that we are not using. Uh, again, something from Gemstone that we are not using. These are things to, to query, query collections. And then, uh, last but not least, Squeak has several strange constructs like this if not nil and if not nil do, uh, which are totally incompatible with any other small talk. So, Seth, we should get rid of them in Faro. No, no. <laughs> but that's a different discussion. <laughs> Anyway, well, actually, you could take that conversation to the standards mailing list if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about my presentation during yours as well, so. But I'm not going into discussions. If you have comments about this particular thing, then that's fine too. And then, Pragmas, uh, they sort of become standard in the past few years, so we don't use them yet, but we might consider using them in future versions of CSET. So this was about the syntax of the small talk language that we restrict ourselves to to ensure the portability. Then there is of course a huge library of code. So what we do there? So for like, first let's talk about the collections. One uh, dangerous thing is to try to compare con collections. Because this equal thing is essentially implemented in all small talk dialects very different. If you implement it at all. So, if we want to compare collections, we just have to do it manually in our code. Then there is something that is also something that's very specific to Squeak and sort of useless anyway because you can just write keys and values to on a sequenceable collection <coughs> instead of with index to, right? So we just use that. And then a very funny method is pairs to that uh, Squeak implements on sequenceable collection and many other small talk dialects also implement that but in various ways. So in Squeak, this evaluates a block that takes two arguments and uh, passes in the first and the second and the third and the fourth, etc. And other small talks throw maybe an exception if there is an odd number of arguments or or show or pass in all the permutations of the collection or do something other fancy. So we cannot just use that. And actually a few years ago there were quite a few users of that and we had to all refactor to those to use something like as that. But fortunately this is portable and works in all small talk dialects. By the way, I forgot to mention in the beginning, all these points that I'm presenting here right now are also available on the Seaside website, seaside.st, that uh, and it lists all the things that in the coding convention. So you just look for coding conventions in the search bar and then you should see these points. Can we use that as a policy I don't know if that's generally usable, but if you follow that, it's certainly much easier. It's, it's especially targeted at T-side, of course, and, and the things it does, but in, in general, it might be not, um, there might be things missing. Do you have some to check Wait a second. <laughs> First, I'm going to talk about strings. These are sort of special collections, but also give some, some problems. So, for example, one thing is that not on all dialects, and even in script I've heard, uh, symbol, a symbol is not a string, so you can't do everything you do with a string also with a symbol, which is sort of obvious. But you have to pay attention, and there used to be code in T-Site that assumed that a symbol is a string as well. That's a very bad thing in small talk that I would really, really, really love to go with the match method in string. Because it's, uh, maybe for those that don't know it, this is sort of a DOS-like, very oldish, regular expression thing. With stars and question marks and... No, hashes. Ha uh, hashes and question marks, I think. Very odd. So. <laughs> and, and best of all, it doesn't work on Squeak, it's totally broken on 
UTF-16, uh, I think, but Philip will, will tell you all the details about that. So, we cannot use that, and it would be really cool if the small talks would just have a regular expression engine that works according to the standards, and not something crappy like that. There is no standard for regular expressions. Yeah, perl regular expressions are pretty well known, so I would, I, I could live with that. <laughs> there is one more problem, how to convert objects to strings. That's something that happens quite often in web applications because in the end, a web application just renders to a, a plain string, a huge HTML file. And we used to use in Squeak uh, the as string method, but unfortunately, it, unfortunately, this gives some problems uh, on platforms that do not support as string on object, and even crash when you try to implement it. So we thought, okay, then let's maybe do display string because that's something that we can easily add to Squeak even on object, and that should work fine on on a an object. But unfortunately there is again another problem here. So that is that some some platforms actually <coughs> return a formatted string or text instead of a plain string as the method says. So that then again doesn't really work in the context of C site. So the only thing that we could do here is to really implement our own conversion method. And that's what we will do in the future as well with Similar cases, we just use the Java conversion and say two string. And we hope that this does not conflict with your code, right? <laughs> so we take that sort of as a namespace. What about real string? No. Yeah, that's something else. That's something for the debugger and for the inspectors. And of course, last but not least with the strings, we have the problem with I.O. That's something that is highly incompatible with across the platform, and uh, we try to avoid it at all costs. And this really works well because, for example, all the low-level socket handling is in the server adapters for the particular <laughs> server, and we really don't care in C side about that. Excuse me. Yeah. Street has been used by quite a couple of libraries already. Oh, yeah, yeah we can discuss that later. Those have been translated from Java. <laughs> the automatic, automatic converted code. Yeah. Well, or beginning students or whatever. But I've seen quite a couple of times that this will change. Okay. And I think, but I'm not sure. Maybe I'm mistaken. Is that the XML framework? Uh, in that case. Uh, and that's why I'm presenting it here. We have it currently like this in, in CSI 2.9, but we are not yet in the alpha phase, so we can still change. I advise so complain scared. now, not in uh, two months. I uh, agree with Bruce with the seaside name in it. So obviously, I showed you now only uh, a small part, essentially, of all the coding conventions and, and, and things that we try to follow to ensure portability. But that's not really something anybody of you could remember all the time, right? And that's why we write tests for that. And that's what I'm going to talk now, and that's what you asked, right? So we, uh, everybody of you, of you knows, uh, Lint for small talk, small lint, yep. that is part of the refactoring browser, right? And it discovers all kinds of, of uh, violations and problems in your code. And you should run that all the time, in my opinion. As often as you run your tests, right? So what we did is we added new rules to, to lint that target particular problems in Seaside. And not only for portability, but also to ensure that the quality of your seaside code is okay. 
So we have six rules to detect portability issues. That's the first part. And how do these look, rules look like? Well, they are rather simple. So the first line detects that the underscore assignment does not work in anything else than squeak. Uh, this rule, the second rule detects that it does not, um, you should not use lit, um, curly brace arrays, and cares too is a, something that, that you should <laughs> never use anyway. So these are our three examples for of these to in total six rules. Then we have rules to detect bugs. And this is now something that every seaside developer should run all the time, right? When you write seaside code, you should run these rules. For example, what's wrong with this first, first uh, paragraph of seaside code? Yes, true, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's something that you can really easily detect statically. Uh, we wrote some rules and it can it will tell you that you have to move that last and in the next step it could even offer you the refactoring to do automatically. What's wrong in the second uh, paragraph of code? That's a bit a trickier one. But I see that all the time in reality. A lot of people are you should just say simulation is hard. Yeah exactly. So that's a Ajax updater. And it renders here to the HTML stream, and eventually through an Ajax update, it, at a later point in time, it will evaluate this block and generate a new HTML stream. But this HTML stream here is, is referring to the old one, so you, you really have to use the one that is passed into the block. And that can be easily detected using, using the refactoring tools, and could even be fixed automatically. But that's not done right at the moment. Then we have some four rules to detect possible bugs. So uh, here I have only one example that combines a lot of errors on one line or two lines. So any takers for this one? What's wrong with this line? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. well, that's the first one. Well. That's the second one, actually. You should not call while rendering. That's what tasks or callbacks are for. Then another thing is that you should not change the state of a, of a component while rendering. Because when you hit refresh, this will all the time change the state of your component. And the third thing is sort of related. So you should not instantiate new components while rendering, because this will recreate that component every time you hit refresh, and you will lose all the state of that component. Right? So these are all things that, in rare conditions, maybe you want to do it, but then you are really on the hacky side. Normally, you don't want to do that. Is there a dot missing at the end of the first line? No, that's a, a method uh, declaration. Oh, that's a method declaration. <coughs> then it should be in bold, right? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't written a rule for that yet. Final requires it to be in bold. Yeah. <laughs> then there are other problems. We can quickly go through that. These are mostly problems where your uh, code is not as, as efficient or as as uh, as short as possible. So what we can do here with the first line is we can just scratch that width because that's not really necessary. You are not setting any attributes. So it's something that. Uh, line will point out. And then here, the block is not really needed. So you can just remove the block and put the high directly into a string to an arg and pass it as an argument to the diff instead of the block. And last but not least, this is something that is stylistic, not really nice, but a lot of people are unfortunately doing it. They put a lot of functionality, of functionality that should rather go to your controller or to your model directly into the view of C site. So here C site and uh, this line points out that you should actually uh, move that functionality somewhere else. So it suggests that you should use the extract to method refactoring. Steve, you call the method of your model in the corner? 
Sorry? You call uh, this uh, method of the model in this one? Yeah, you, you will still yes. call the extracted code from within your callback, but you should not put all the functionality into the view rendering code, right? So these are all things that uh, are are applied by our, our, our rules. So have a look at the rules. It's in the one-click image now. So you just download your one-click image, load your code, and try out the rules, and I'm sure you will find some problems. I found dozens of problems in Peer and in Magritte, and I fixed them all. And I think that improved the code quality a lot. So talking about tests. Last year, I showed you this, this graphic with the unit tests. So you all know that we are currently working on Seaside 2.9 and that we are also, also writing a lot of, of tests in, in 2.9. So uh, any guesses how many tests we already have in 2.9? Not enough to fit on that slide. Yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> very true. So let's have a look where actually this, this bar ends and move a bit up. <laughs> it's not coming yet. So we are currently here, and I'm sure we will hit the 400 test uh, bar. So just to give you an overview over this slide, I shrink everything a bit together. So you see that with CSI 2.9, we more than three times more tests than in, in previous versions, and CSI 2.9 will probably even be more than 3.0 uh, times more, more tests. So that was just a, a small uh, um, note in brackets. Let's go back to the portability stuff and let's have a look at the source format. So what kind of source formats are we using? So first of all to note, we are not using any interchange formats. I remember when I came to Smalltalk in 2002, everybody was talking about source exchange formats. We are not using that. We are, in Squeak at least, solely using Monticello. And I made a small table that shows the relationship of Squeak or Squeak uh, forks towards other Smalltalks and how this uh, conversion of the source codex actually works. So there is a way to get code from Squeak into all the other small talks because they all support small talk, uh, Seaside in some way. So Syncom, as far as I know, is sort of reading the Monticello file and loading the code into their image. Gemstone has done a very good thing. They implemented Monticello in Gemstone and they just load our code. So that's nice. And new small talk and all is, is doing something similar. But now uh, the other parts are a bit more difficult. So what do you do, for example, if you have seaside code in, in a symptom small talk and want to move it back to squeak? Or if you found a bug and fixed it in symptom seaside uh, and want to merge it back into the main branch? And now this is really where the trouble starts because that's not really easy. There are tools to do that. So there are exporters in VisualWorks or in... Or in or in GNU small talk, or in Dolphin, to get that code back into, into Seaside. But for us, this is very difficult, because we don't exactly know what modifications you did to the code, what, where, from what Seaside version you were taking that code from, and merging is not a, a one-click step anymore. That's just the case with Gemstone, because they have the full versioning information, and we can just merge back the code. And this is why we really think that to not get locked down into these other dialects, you really should, or the vendors should, uh, investigate importing either Monticello or Monticello 2. Because now Monticello 2 is coming up, and this is really a cool thing. It's designed from ground up to be compatible across the different platforms. And this would, would really make the life of the porters, the life of the people that fix bugs, and our life much easier because we could just merge back your changes into our code. Was that sort of convincing? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> so Monticello 2. Have a look at Monticello 2. This is really the future of Smalltalk source code exchange, I think. Sorry. That, that really works, alright? What, what, what went on during the first year of porting, since I supported Monticello from the start, or once I got once I got to that point, I would go in and make changes.
changes in my repository, and I come back in a week or so and look at what uh, Philippe and uh, Lucas have been doing. Without ever having to talk to me or anything, they, were, they saw the code that I put in there, decided which ones they wanted to put in the seaside, and just did it. And it was, it was relatively magic. I was just moving forward, you know. I didn't, it didn't cost me anything to feed the, feed the changes back. All right? I, you know, that, was, that was marvelous. And, you know, so that, that worked well. And then parts of it, you didn't take everything. And that's fine. And then I would merge back in. And uh, that was it. So, so that really works, and it works well, because the cost is you write your code, you can fix the bugs. Somebody else can look and decide whether they want it or not. You don't have to push. You know, you don't have to ask. You don't have to say, look at this. When you take it, the information is there. And if they do take it, if they don't take it, you're still going to be able to merge and it's no big deal. So, anyway. How much effort was it for you? I think uh, the tools, the tools were probably the biggest issue. Um, this okay, uh, Loudly is, I spent a month getting Monticello working, and I spent a month getting the zip file stuff working. All right? And at that point, I had, I basically was supporting Monticello with, with workspaces. All right? Um, I lived along with using tools that were built in, in Squeak for a while. But even the tools, I think, uh, Avi wrote them in about a week. So, you know, I was probably just bring that. So. Well, well, I guess Monticello 1 is a bit hairy support to different dialects because it has no generic model of how to version the, the code entities. Well, but yeah. Monticello 2 should be much easier in that regard. And the one thing I, the one thing I want to say is it's a, it, it can be pretty much um, you don't need necessarily the, the same set of tools to push and pull as you do if you're living in the environment all the time. You know, the set of tools can be a little bit different. So. Okay. So what we do for, for platform form support. So for all the rest, that does not really that is not really platform compatible. So right now, I'm sorry Bruce, we are not using sport. Uh, we have our own little class, uh, Smalltalk uh, Seaside Platform Support. And it's essentially a place where every vendor or every porter has to implement certain functionality that we cannot just do in a way that it works on all platforms. And we try to keep it as small and clean as possible. Now there are two small other things that, we, that I would like to talk about. This is the as you're there, I'd like to point. Why aren't you using sports? Sorry? Why are you not using sports? Well, there are several things. First of all, we don't need the functionality that is in sports. So as far as I understand, this is mostly about files and sockets and exceptions, right? Well, and the fact that streams started in a different place and the fact that file translations happen differently in the fact that dates and time handle differently in the fact that... Okay, okay. Yeah, these would be sort of useful, but uh, I think the, the problems that we have are in, are in different areas, like maybe Felix can, can chime in here. Uh, I would like to look at the code. Um, there is a partial implementation that comes in forward that uses support, but uh, uses what's available to support, but it does not full implementation. Yeah, we would still need, we, we cannot do everything that we need to do with sport. That's okay, I'm just thinking that what we're trying to do is still sport by getting the existing standard. We're going to have the, all the... Well, that would be perfect, of course. Right. Then we're going to get them all in one place. So can... Okay, then, then one or two remaining things that I wanted to talk about just briefly is the namespace prefix we are using. Squeak has no standardized... Uh, uh, namespace implementation, that that's why we are using these prefixes. Now, something that we see quite often is that people use these two letters for their own code. Even vendors use this to name their classes with this prefix. But that's really the idea that nobody else than the core code should contain these two letters at the beginning of the class so that we can name our stuff the way we, uh, we like. So this is really a seaside thing. Even if you write your small example applications, you should maybe consider it naming differently. Right. So that's one thing. And the other thing that we are doing for packaging, and I'm not going into details here because Julian was already talking about that this morning, is the packaging. So we have a fairly standard 
uh, group of packages that work on all the platforms, and then every vendor can essentially add their own packages that are particular to their uh, platform. So, how does our dream vendor look like? <laughs> um, I'm quickly going through that. So, we would like to have some some sort of a feedback loop. So we, we would like if you do continuous integration and would immediately use a public, at least a public bug tracker so that we know what kind of problems you face. It would be the best if you use our Google bug tracker. There are tags for every supported platform already, but that never happened up to now that somebody from a different platform had the bug. Then I already mentioned that we would love if you use Monticello or Monticello 2 so that we can actually get back your changes into the main branch. And this is something that is just general remarks. We would like you to build one-click images as well. So the one-click image is essentially a full stack solution. It's not usable for, for production in most cases, but it, it works out of the box. So provide something that works out of the box. And something we, we really appreciate is supporting multi-CPUs. That's also some, something that is coming with Squeak right now, with the Hydra project. So we are very much looking forward into that direction and where this is taking us to. And the, the things that Philip that is going to talk about soon. I'm also not going to talk about this. This is, by the way, uh, Chinese for, for Seaside. I don't know, I found that on the net somewhere. <laughs> uh, does anybody understand that actually? <laughs> Next time I'll ask you if I need something like that. And um, provide a better user interface for development. This is also something that I spent quite some time during this year with the link rules and also with the refactoring tool integration in Squeak. This is something that I think all the small top dialects can, uh, or there is a lot of potential to improve in that area. Now I already announced, and you might have heard, that we are doing a seaside sprint from Friday afternoon and Saturday during the whole day. So I'm going to give a quick overview about that, and then you are essentially free to have your coffee. Uh, so this sprint will start right after ESA um, and will be also on Saturday and maybe on Sunday if there are interested people. So Philip and I have to leave on Sunday at, at lunchtime, but until then we uh, essentially plan to work very hard on goals that will be defined at the beginning of the sprint. So who do we address? So we don't address everybody. That would be too much and we cannot host that many people. We are thinking about maybe 10 people that are really into Seaside, that want to contribute, that want to maybe become a core developer and, and already contributed code to the, uh, to the library. And then there was, we are also interested into the, the people that work on ports to various platforms or, or vendors that want to discuss with us uh, in what direction we should go. So the main goal uh, of this sprint is towards a version of Seaside that can be tested by a big amount of people, not just by us and a few interested uh, uh, programmers. So, and the last question is, where will it be? Uh, that hasn't been determined yet, so you have to contact us if you uh, want to know the exact location. Likely it will be at two different uh, locations on Friday and Saturday. Of course, as usual, I have some small thing yet left. Uh, the first part was actually already showed yesterday by Don. So you have seen this uh, iPhone thing for Peer. But actually, this is, if you step one, one, uh, one step back, then you you probably already guessed that there is a library behind the whole thing that you can actually download and use to build uh, C-Sign applications for uh, the iPhone. And you can download it here from this URL and I can show you another little example. 
that we wrote together. And essentially, this is now showing up on the wrong screen. So what you see here is a code browser for Smalltalk. It's really easy. This was about uh, 60, 70 lines of, of Smalltalk code to write this uh, code, and you can browse the image. And so, for example, you can have a look at collections and go into a method. <coughs> Which one do you not want? This one. This is quite popular, I think. <coughs> you can change. It. <laughs> um, you can see it. Yeah, I'm not using the iPhone keyboard right now. <laughs> and then you can save that method, and this should have been compiled that new method. No, that's that's a simulator of the iPhone. Yeah, it's running on any. It's running on. Also on the Android platform, it should be running. It's running on any WebKit it's browser. Okay. Okay. So this means that if I really want to do some stuff, you need web access or somehow run the web server on your iPhone. I hope so. Yes. Okay. And that's a library, as I said. You can download this library from the Montessori repository of mine. All the JavaScript code that is needed is in there. There are two examples, and that's all I wanted to show you. If you have any questions, I'm around till Sunday at lunchtime.